Silent Hill 2 has long been regarded by its fan base as one of the best examples, if not the peak, of the survival horror genre. With its creepy atmosphere, disturbing creatures, and surreal dialogue, mostly due to the performances rather than the words themselves, Silent Hill 2 has been seen as a worthy successor to the first game in the series, which leaned more heavily into the survival horror and terror side of things than the psychological horror that Silent Hill 2 tended to lean into more, though that's not to say the original didn't have its fair share as well. So, when it was announced that Silent Hill 2 would be getting a full remake in the way that the earlier titles in the Resident Evil series had been receiving, there was much rejoicing. In the frozen land of Nador, they were forced to eat Robin's minstrels. And there was much rejoicing. Over time, and with the surge of backlash and discussion over things like DEI programs, ESG, wokeness, and the overall glut of remakes and remasters that had been flooding the market, the conversation around Silent Hill 2 Remake began to shift. On top of that, there was the fact that the team commissioned by Konami to spearhead the remake, Blooper Team, had a somewhat divisive track record. Some loved their work and the visual design of their games, while others derided them as being derivative and somewhat ham-fisted. Was this the studio that really needed to be in charge of the remake, given their apparent fumbles with other horror games, despite being heavily influenced by the likes of Silent Hill 2 themselves? Add in the fact that they hired a narrative consultancy firm called Hit Detection to consult on the game, and the more hardcore and reactionary side of the fanbase began to screech and claim that this game was going to be nothing more than a pile of woke garbage, and that the obvious change to one character's outfit was proof that the developers were clueless about the source material and were going to butcher the story beyond belief. <laughs> Anyone who pre-ordered it or had any optimism about the game was derided as being complicit in the cancer that was destroying the industry, and true Silent Hill fans should boycott the game and have nothing to do with this soulless cash grab of a remake. No! Unacceptable! At the time all of this was going on, there wasn't much we had seen by the way of footage. There were some teaser trailers and some combat footage which had met with mixed results. However, by the time I became aware of all this, it appeared as though Bloober Team had adjusted some of the visuals, such as in the opening cinematic with James looking at his reflection in the restroom, and overall these changes were welcomed by fans as looking better than originally produced. However, there was still the firestorm surrounding other characters, and accusations of the developers trying to make the women ugly, and making one character secretly trans because of her jawline and lower vocal register. This had convinced some among the more reactionary side of things that, as previously alleged, the developers were going to ruin the game. They don't understand the story. This one character needs to be an absolute smoke show for the story to work, and this other one should be hot too because we want hot girls in games. I released a video around this time going over some of the more unhinged criticisms I had seen and argued that Although I understood concerns about certain changes, and that, generally speaking, I also dislike narrative consultancy groups like Hit Detection and SBI to just name two, I didn't think what we had seen was demonstrative that the game was going to be a miserable failure of a game, or that it was going to be in yet another DEI disaster. It certainly wasn't going to be Concord, that was for sure. I still stand by what I said in that video at the time. Based on what we saw, it was still too early to predict what the final product would be. I also stand by my assertion that those of us on the conservative side and those who stand against progressive politics and ideology being shoehorned into games where they don't belong, which good luck on that, I believe there is a way to frame your criticisms that don't make you appear as some closeted porn obsessed incel who has never seen a real woman in their life, let alone ever touched a boob or grass for that matter. However, reading the comments, there were many who were incapable of understanding that message. Make your criticisms fairly, and don't just throw red meat out for the people on your side, because then you just make yourself appear just as radical and unreasonable as you accuse the other side of being. My position at the time was simply this. There are legitimate reasons to be concerned about what was going to happen with Silent Hill 2 Remake, and we shouldn't downplay those criticisms. But we also need to be level-headed about this. 
wait and see what happens, and then make a judgment call based on what is in the final product, not what we are afraid is going to be in it. So, now that I've had time to play through the game and even get the Platinum Trophy on it, how do I feel about it? Were those on my side who were screeching at the heavens that the game was going to be a woke disaster filled with gender politics and a thoroughly butchered story for the modern gaming audience, whoever that is because it isn't the people who actually play games, right? Were all of their fears justified? Am I going to have to eat crow in this video without the benefit of having it well prepared or seasoned? Well, to those on my side who were convinced that this game was nothing more than a soulless cash grab that was going to spit in the face of fans and take a big steamy dump on the original. You might as well have just dropped your pants and laid a turd right on Mr. Venezuela's head. I have only this one thing to say. Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. You're wrong. I'll admit. I was getting somewhat worried about the game myself, since for quite a while we had seen nothing about Eddie either. I was almost certain that they were going to take Eddie and turn him into some sort of woman-hating incel, or at worst, gender swap him to make some point about the character breaking because of being oppressed by the patriarchy or some other such leftist nonsense. But then, they released another story trailer which showed Eddie, and my goodness was he even fatter and more unsettling than in the original. I was stoked, and the game's release couldn't get here soon enough. In fact, about the only fleeting regret I had about the game was not buying the digital deluxe edition so I could start playing it over a weekend instead of having to wait until a Tuesday evening after work to get started. And then I realized I gained basically nothing important besides that, and the cosmetics and Early access weren't actually worth paying another 10 bucks for, so screw that. More on pricing later, though. I plan on doing two other videos about the remake and spending more time digging deeper into the difference between the two games, including locations and character portrayals, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them here, since I believe both of those need to have their own separate discussion in order to do them justice. For now, though, let me begin by saying that I was far from disappointed in the game. For those that didn't watch my last video on the subject, I haven't played the Silent Hill series since I completed Silent Hill 3. I played a demo for Silent Hill 4 and was intrigued by it, but at the time I just didn't have the money to spend on it, and so it just sort of fell by the wayside, and I've still yet to play it. The general impression I get from fans is that Silent Hill 4 was a good game overall, and had some interesting lore and concepts that even tied back to one of the characters mentioned in Silent Hill 2, but it didn't live up to the standard set by the first three games. Personally, as much as I liked Silent Hill 2 when I first played the original PC release sometime between 2004 and 2007, I forget what year of college I got around to it, though it may have been after I got asked not to come back in early 2007, I still preferred the atmosphere and tone of Silent Hill 1 and 3 more. I thought they were far more terrifying and sinister in tone than 2 ever approached, but I still enjoyed the second one quite a bit. There's something about your first time playing a new Silent Hill game that you just really can't put into words. The low visibility, the feeling of dread around every corner, the absurd amount of locked doors, and the puzzles that feel somewhat obtuse at first but turn out to be generally satisfying once you figure them out really adds to the atmosphere and mystique that made the early games so great. It was a noticeable difference from their competition, Resident Evil. While Resident Evil also was a very strong survival horror series, I always found Silent Hill to be more terrifying. Silent Hill 2 leaned harder into the psychological aspect of things, as any number of video essays on the subject will tell you, even if I think many of them miss the point and overemphasize certain aspects of the story. Fortunately, in recent years, the creators have clarified certain plot points and symbolism in Silent Hill 2 which correct some of these misunderstandings, which I feel is reflected fairly well in the remake. So, where do we begin? Now, Before getting into the story, let's talk about the environments. First, the original Silent Hill was not a terribly long game. I went through it recently on standard difficulty again just so I would have it fresh in my mind to be able to recognize what was different a bit easier. Prior to this, I don't think I had played it since my college days, 
I remember the story, but I had only a hazy memory of the game itself, the apartments and the hospital being the locations that stuck in my head the most. So I ran through it again using a walkthrough to avoid most of the locked doors and just get to where I needed to go without having to do a lot of unnecessary backtracking and exploration. Doing that, I completed the game in about four hours. Had I not used a walkthrough, I could see how it could easily take closer to twice that long, which is where most people tend to put the length of the first game, roughly eight hours. So when the remake was announced, gamers were told that this game would be roughly twice the length of the original. More on that later. Most importantly, I was curious how the atmosphere of the game would be. Beyond the story, this was something that absolutely needed to be done correctly. The problem with survivor horror games in general in my experience anyway, is that outside of playing the game on a higher difficulty or having some way of randomizing where things are placed, once you've completed a game like Silent Hill or Resident Evil, they just aren't scary anymore. You know where things are and you know how to handle it. When I played through the original Silent Hill 2 again, well, the enhanced PC edition with their final update that was just released, the game really didn't scare me at all. Now, Part of that may have been because I was using a walkthrough so I didn't have to wander around aimlessly looking for stuff, but even without that, it just didn't do much for me because I'd played it before. I don't know if that would still be true for 1 or 3, but like I said before, the tone of those games feels much darker and sinister than anything in 2. That said, I was somewhat afraid that this would be my experience with the remake. After all, I had just played through the original, so how could this possibly do anything to create that atmosphere in you? Well, I don't know exactly how they did it, but my goodness, did they crank it out of the park. I saw people complaining about the fog effects for some reason, and it's true that in the early part of the game, about up until the time you get into the town proper, the fog isn't terribly thick. However, the further you progress and the more time passes, the heavier and thicker it seems to get. In fact, one of the things that was interesting is just how much more lived in the town feels. You could get through the town in the original and into the apartments pretty quickly just by running straight to the dead end of the corpse, loot the key, and then go on to the only set of apartments nearby. Funnily enough, I was watching a particular stream of the game, mostly to read the comment section, filled with people who had nothing better to do than continuously spamming criticism about Mangela or Manjala or Trangela, whatever you prefer. It's all obviously very hilarious and not at all overdone. <laughs> and one person mocked the remake for having the key labeled with Woodside Apartments. It just tells you where to go next. It's so stupid. The game just holds your hand, apparently. No, that's just how it was in the original, too. Except in the remake, there is another set of apartments you can access. It's required for progressing to the point of getting the apartment key for the Woodside Apartments. The original only had one set you could actually access. Anyway, I digress. Once you get the key to the apartments, a storm sort of whips up out of nowhere, and the fog seems to be much heavier and more oppressive, and more monsters seem to start showing up, essentially forcing you to make a beeline to the apartments for safety, however fleeting that may be. I'll dig into this more when I discuss the various locations themselves in more detail in a separate video, but one of the things that makes the remake longer is the inclusion of new puzzles and collectibles which are required to advance in the story. The early part of the town is essentially a tutorial for how the rest of the game loop will be. Get to a new area, figure out where you need to go, and then explore looking for key items and clues to solve the puzzle which will then grant you access to a new area, lather, rinse, repeat. This works pretty well for most of the game, but there were times that I was eager to move on to the next zone, but still had plenty of exploration and puzzle solving to do. Now, to be fair, this really only became an issue for me in Toluca Prison, which between that and the labyrinth were always my least favorite parts of the game in the original. The hotel isn't as bad. Honestly, it was just these minor pacing issues that got on my nerves near that mid to late game portion. They were more enjoyable, generally speaking, this time around, but I think they probably could have scaled back some of this stuff just a little bit, and it would have been almost perfect. 
Now, I've sort of derailed for a second here in explaining the gameplay loop, which, if we're honest, is how the original worked as well. However, instead of finding a bunch of key items to solve puzzles, oftentimes it was just finding solutions to puzzles which would give you a key or combination to something. Combining items was still important from time to time, but I feel like it was increased in this one because the puzzles themselves often require combined items to finish building the mechanical device, which you would then need to get to do something in particular. The clock in the apartments, for example, still has the same solution as the original, but you first have to find the individual hands of the clock and assemble it together before you can solve the puzzle. Each of these is usually hidden behind exploration or another puzzle related to something in the environment. Getting back to my original point about the atmosphere of the game, the Silent Hill 2 remake, through its use of silence, ambient music, and the overall sound design, does an incredible job of making you feel uneasy. The fog in the town does a great job of obscuring your vision, just as it did in the original, and the nighttime slash otherworld darkness does an equally good job. In fact, I would say the otherworld and nighttime portions do an even better job in this game because, from my perspective, the pocket light in the original seemed much brighter and provided better lighting and visibility than in the remake. Also, while certain key items are obtained in the same way, pocket light from the mannequin, gun from the shopping cart, etc., the layout of the different zones has been changed. Despite all the comparisons to the Resident Evil 2 remake, I think it would be more accurate to compare this to the differences between Resident Evil 1 on PSX and then on GameCube. I actually really like the maps of the remake. The level design, the graphics, and the attention to detail all make the town feel so much more like a town that has been abandoned. It genuinely feels lived in. It feels like a real place. On top of that, the new layout for the different zones encourages you to explore every nook and cranny just as you would have needed to do in the original the first time you played it. You can't just rely on an old PS2 walkthrough to get you through the game. You discover these locations all over again for yourself. And for me, that's what made the difference. I didn't know where anything was going to be located. The original puzzles had returned along with some new ones, and even some of the original puzzles, such as the coin puzzle on the apartments, had a new twist on them. So you couldn't just rely on the original solutions for all of them either. And this added a layer of immersion to the experience that was just like I experienced when I first played the original three games so many years ago. I felt like I was always in danger of something taking me out, and thus there was a layer of tension and foreboding every time I went into a new room. There was no run and gun or even run around everything approach like I could take in the original. And that's not to say you can't avoid combat, because most times you can, but you can't always rely on that. You're going to have to be prepared to fight, which leads me to my next point, the combat. The Silent Hill 2 fandom is no stranger to the phenomenon of rose-colored glasses and finding ways to retcon why things were the way they were in the original. For example, rather than admitting that tank controls, a staple of late 90s and early 2000s survival horror games, and somewhat clunky combat were simply the consequence of hardware limitations and the fact that combat wasn't the main focus of the game, certain among the fandom have come up with elaborate theories to explain this. And most commonly is the claim that well, James was never meant to be an action hero, and so the developers intentionally made sure that combat was hard and difficult because James was an everyman character, and so you were supposed to be afraid to fight things. You sure about that? You sure about that? You sure about that? Which, of course, is... Why James could easily carry around tons of healing items, a rifle, a shotgun, a handgun, hundreds of rounds of ammo, and be a perfect shot as long as he aimed in the general direction of whatever he was trying to shoot. The janky and awkward animations weren't because combat was just sort of thrown together. No, it was some meta commentary on how a normal person would fight in these circumstances or any such revisionist nonsense. We actually had... Combat was kind of crap because that wasn't the main focus of the game and the devs weren't worried about making it fluid and smooth. Silent Hill 2 was not meant to be Resident Evil 2. Quit trying to make it sound like it was some genius literary device. Now, that being said, how is the combat in the remake? It's far better, but it's still not something that you necessarily want to engage in if you can avoid it. Combat animations do have some level of awkwardness to them, and it's a lot easier to miss shots in this game. 
enemies, even on standard, can easily drain you of your resources, which again is why exploration is a must. Mannequins are far more prevalent in this game and are the biggest pain in the butt in Remake because they love to hide and crouch in corners and jump you when you least expect it. Which leads me to another detail about combat. The radio. Now, early on, just like in the original, when you get the radio, it emits static when enemies are nearby. Now, if I recall correctly, this typically went off all the time. And by that, I simply mean that if an enemy was nearby, the radio would emit static. If I remember, in Silent Hill 1, this became somewhat unreliable in the end game, in the nowhere section, and it would either not go off when enemies were close, or it would emit static when there was nothing around. At that point, trust in the radio was unreliable. In Silent Hill 2, I don't recall this ever being an issue, at least not in the original. In Remake, the game tends to get you used to hearing static when enemies are nearby, but then it pulls that rug out from underneath you early on, especially once you hit the apartments. Remember how I said that the mannequins love to sneak attack you? Do you want to guess what doesn't go off when they're hiding and standing still? That's right, the radio. Now, once they start attacking you, then you'll hear the radio beginning emitting static, but that's a bit like getting hit by a car and then someone telling you as you lay bleeding on the ground, hey, there was a car coming from that direction. That's actually not a bad analogy, considering that the mannequins can hit like a truck and will destroy you if you aren't careful. Even when you get a handle on the melee aspect of things, you still have to be careful because you can't always predict what the enemy AI is going to do. Sometimes they'll follow a pattern, and sometimes they'll pull off a point-blank attack while you're in the middle of swinging at them. Or they'll dodge. Or in the case of the nurses, they'll stop your hand and push you backwards and off balance. I've seen a lot of people compare the combat to Callisto Protocol, but I never did play that, so I'll take their word for it. In most one-on-one -on -one cases, things don't usually get out of hand. But when you get into a room with what you thought was one enemy, and it turns out there were others in the room you didn't notice, well, it can go sideways real quick. I learned very soon that walking into rooms without trying to look around every possible corner and vantage point before proceeding further was often a mistake. If you don't try to check out a room first and just blindly barge in, you're going to have a bad time. That's actually one of the advantages to the remake using the over-the-shoulder camera angle. Fixed angles were actually seen as a restriction due to hardware in the original, a necessary evil, as it were. Now, they did great with what they had, but I feel like the modern camera accomplishes the same goal since there's still limited visibility for what you can see on screen. Still, this only added to that feeling of unease and dread that something like Silent Hill 2 needed in order to recreate that feeling I had in my initial playthrough of the original. That said, there are still those parts where I think the remake, unfortunately, uses survival horror tropes that I just absolutely hate. Well, I don't know if hate is the right word. They just feel out of place in Silent Hill. The biggest offender is the trope of walking into an area with a lot of bodies on the ground that appear dead, but you know perfectly well you didn't put them there. The only reason they exist is to become animated at the most inconvenient time, usually after collecting a key item. To look a prison as one of these. You go into the shower room, which is littered with bodies, you get a key item out of the wall, and oh, surprise, surprise, now they're all up and want to kill me. Now, fortunately, even in these cases, you can largely avoid direct combat and find some way to get out of the area without having to drain resources, but I still wish they had just left that kind of thing out of it since it wasn't present in the original from what I recall. Plus, is anyone ever actually scared by that anymore? I feel like most of us look at it and just roll our eyes and say, great, I'm gonna have to deal with this nonsense soon, whoop de doo It's more of an annoyance than anything else. I get it's a common trope in games like this, but it's just a bit tiresome at this point. Oh, and speaking of resources, before I forget, I did see someone criticize the remake for giving you too many resources based on the stream that this comment was set in, but even the original was pretty generous with resources as long as you did the exploration and were conservative with using them. I had a small hoard of ammunition and healing items in the original by the time I made it to the prison, and the same was true in this version as well. 
I would imagine that changes on harder difficulties, especially with enemies becoming bullet sponges and nigh indestructible against melee attacks, but at that point the game isn't necessarily fun to me so much as it becomes a slog and an exercise in beating your head against a wall and brute forcing your way through. So sound design, soundtrack, and atmosphere of the game I feel was nailed almost perfectly, even if there were some gimmicky things I didn't particularly care for and I thought felt forced. Pacing was a bit slow at points, but those were really only in areas I never really liked in the original either, so your mileage may vary. The most important aspect, beyond the environment and the horror aspect of the game being nailed, is of course, the story. This was an area where even I had my reservations about what was going to happen with it. I said in my original video that I was fine with them changing Maria's outfit so long as they kept her personality and how she interacts with James the same since I felt that was far more crucial to get right. I even said I kind of dug her new outfit since it still worked for her. About the only complaint I have with her original outfit is that, in my opinion, it would just look dated and tacky. It's in the game as an easter egg, which some claimed was a slap in the face to fans and spits on the original. That was Vera Dark, for anyone who's curious when she was on side-scrollers recently, and yes, I rolled my eyes pretty hard at that. Maria even seems to like the outfit herself, even though she doesn't wear it, so to me it was just a nice nod to the original. Hey, you think I'd look good in this one? Um... Sure. Not quite the ringing endorsement, but hey, I'll take it. Incidentally, there are all sorts of little easter eggs and nods to set pieces and even key items from the original littered throughout the remake for you to find, so again, go exploring. Anyway, beyond that, there were those screaming from the rooftops that the original cast was always and forever the superior cast of voice actors that could never be improved upon. And, oh, I gotta tell you, it was perfect. Perfect. Everything, down to the last minute details. Again, the characters and their portrayals really needs its own separate video for me to really do the subject justice, and I don't want this video being any longer than it's already going to be. So for now, let me just say this. I think the cast for Remake really nailed it. I think James was much better in this one. Laura was just about perfect, except for maybe one scene near the end. Mary slash Maria is played very well, and I think is even more forward and flirtatious with James, and there are more interactions and many conversations they can have while exploring the town, which helps to make her a much more interesting character. I found myself caring about Maria far more than in the original, since she felt like a more fleshed out character this time. And that's actually true for most of the characters, actually. In the original, you spend most of the game as James running around by himself, and the supporting cast is only in the game for a few brief moments to help move James's story forward. In terms of screen time, Maria has the most, followed by Angela, Laura, and then Eddie being the last. I think. I'm pretty sure he had the least amount of presence in the original. And this still remains true in the remake, but there are now additional scenes with both Maria and Angela that help to make them feel more like real people that you care about. Angela seems to be a much more tragic figure in this version, and the times where her trauma resurfaces and she lashes out at James verbally sound so much more visceral than anything in the original. Angela, it's okay. No, don't touch me! Eddie even though he still has very little screen time, comes across as so much more deeply disturbed and unsettling as a character, especially when you meet him again in Toluca Prison. This is a man that you can tell is deeply disturbed and psychotic and has a much more intimidating presence. He feels like a genuinely evil person by that point in the game, and the fight in the meat locker with him is so much better than the original. <laughs> you should see your face, James. I was just joking. In fact, pretty much all of the boss fights are more interesting and entertaining. I don't want to spoil anything, but the fight against, well, let's just call him AD. If you know, you know is greatly expanded, and the way the environments change and the subtle details in the area surrounding who he is and what he did hit so much harder in this version. For those who thought Bloober would shy away from dealing with this subject, 
I feel like they made it feel so much worse and makes this boss's actions come across even more atrociously. Beating him earns you the trophy Unforgivable, and after completing the fight and the subsequent interactions with a certain character, you can't help but feel the same way. And by that I mean you understand why this boss deserved this trophy title, not that the extremist fans who will nitpick everything to death will be vindicated in calling this remake unforgivable for being made at all. I'll go full spoilers on this when I make my video on how the plot was handled in more depth. Overall, I think the cast did an amazing job with their performances. I know. There are those fanatics out there who believe that the original was practically sent down from Mount Sinai, the code engraved on stone tablets for the developers to reproduce. I've seen the term dreamlike thrown around far too much with respect to the original's dialogue, and I still have no idea what that means. I know there was a very David Lynch feel to the dialogue and performances. No, 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 the dialogue was actually really good. It was supposed to sound melodramatic and weird because it was like something David Lynch would write. You just don't get it. I know exactly what the inspiration was, and I still like the new version better. I can appreciate stuff like Twin Peaks for what it is. <laughs> oh my god. <sighs> but there are people who just don't like it. There are those who don't like this one for the opposite reasons. They'll say it's trash because the actors don't sound weird enough or the, the acting doesn't have some cheesy, dreamlike, whatever that means, feel to it, and that ruins the story. I've played both, and I think both communicate the story perfectly well in their own right. It's a matter of preference alone. About the only exception I would make to this would be with Maria slash Mary. I like the way the performance is portrayed in this game overall, but there is something about the original actress's portrayal that stands apart. I don't think does a bad job at all. I think she does a great job with Maria, but there are a few lines that just don't quite hit the same as in the original. I don't know if this was due to the voice direction or not. I think part of it also has to do with the facial animations. The same thing happens with one scene with Laura, where the line delivery and facial animations don't quite match up with what you should expect of someone saying the lines they are saying at the time. Again, I'll go more into that in a separate video doing a direct comparison. Overall, I think the original actress did a phenomenal job, and the new actress did incredibly well too, but I still have to give the edge to the original. That said, the more I've heard from the new Maria, the more it's grown on me. I still don't think she's quite on par with Monica Taylor Horgan. Her reading of Mary's letter at the end will always be just a heartbreaking performance. Does a great job with it too, and after listening to it several times, I've gained a deeper appreciation for it. Again, it's not on par with the original, but I think she comes close most of the time. I don't want to write off all criticisms of the new VA as people just being contrary because they love the original so much, but I do think much of the criticism of the new cast is a bit overblown. Uh, what else is there? And the soundtrack is still amazing, as was the original. There are those who have criticized the new arrangements as not being as good as the original. I'm not going to speak to that because I haven't listened to the soundtrack for the original as much as some of these have. I saw one person say that one of the tracks incorporated the sirens in it frequently, which of course was proof positive that Bloober Team didn't have any idea what the sirens were, they were all incompetent and blah blah blah. I didn't notice anything like that at all, and the only time I remember hearing the sirens in game was with Pyramid Head. So. If you're not someone who has made the original soundtrack part of your frequent listening list, you probably won't notice either. I've listened to the soundtracks of games like Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger more times than I can count, so I've been able to pick up on some of the changes in the Pixel Remaster soundtracks as well. I can't say the same for this soundtrack, so I'll just say I still enjoyed it, but your mileage may vary depending on how familiar you are with the original. Oh, and all of the original endings are still there, along with two new endings available for New Game Plus. You can actually get all the endings in two playthroughs if you know what you're doing. I'll go over those in more detail with the story discussion in another video. Only one ending has changed in any significant way as far as the original endings go, but it was one of the joke endings. I'm ambivalent over the changes. I understand why they did it, but I'm not sure I like the change compared to the original. It strikes more or less the same tone, but it just plays out slightly differently. Again, that's for another time. So where do I stand on this? 
Do I think Silent Hill 2 is a worthy remake of the original? Absolutely. I know there are those out there who disagree and simply hate all remakes on principle at this point, especially when we have so many unnecessary remakes and remasters like the Horizon Zero Dawn remaster and the Until Dawn remaster. I don't see any reason for these to exist either, especially since both of them still look great on the previous console generation. And don't get me wrong, seeing a higher quality version of Hayden Panettiere as Samantha is almost enough to get me to buy the Until Dawn remaster, but not quite. Nice try. And would I recommend picking this up? Yeah, it's a bit more complicated. If you're someone who hates remakes and thinks the original version was unimprovable and you refuse to hear any opinion that isn't essentially filleting the original, no, unacceptable, then let's be honest, you weren't probably going to buy this anyway. Would I recommend playing this if you've never played the original? And that's probably the hardest question, because I do believe the original is absolutely worth playing. You can easily find the PC version on My Abandonware, and then look up the enhanced PC edition mods, which, as far as I'm concerned, is probably the best remaster work I've seen in a long time, especially from independent developers who had nothing but a strong passion to make the PC version at as good as it can be for modern PCs. I would definitely recommend this over the HD port on PS3, plus it's easier to come across, plus it's not a long game. If you're someone who wants to play both, then yeah, start with the enhanced PC version. I did see someone recommend limiting the frame rate to 30 FPS to keep that dreamlike feel of the original. Again, that's a vaguely enough defined term to be just about useless, and I never got that feeling. But you do you. I will never discourage anyone from playing the original, let alone fault anyone for preferring it to the remake. However, if you're new to the series and you're not worried about playing the originals, I'd say this is a good entry to start with, and I think it does a great job of replicating the feeling I had playing the original nearly 20 years ago. As for those who were conflicted about buying this because Blooper Team hired a narrative development company and you don't want to support a company who works with people who, admittedly, have some rather distasteful views towards gamers in many cases, that's a decision you have to make for yourself. I understand the rationale behind it. I know Kirsha and plenty of others have expressed the view that she really wants to play it, but she refuses to because they worked with Hit Detection, which deals with a lot of DEI and ESG stuff. Pro probably, probably not going to play it, simply because, as I said before, even if Hit Detection has nothing crazy noticeable, right? If they, even if they've only uglified like one or two female characters. I don't want to reward developers that hire these subversive Marxist companies by buying their games. If, if I buy Silent Hill 2, that is a signal to the developers that yes, Hit Detection is a fine company to partner with, yes, Hit Detection is someone that you should partner with, and it's not going to lose you money. And I don't want to send that signal. Even if I am just one person, my wallet will not be going to that, and it will make me feel better. I think that's a respectable position to take, even if it's not one I take myself. I'm more concerned with the final product rather than who developed it. I think it's absurd that there are people who will sell their Teslas just because they hate Elon Musk now. I would find it hypocritical to call those people foolish for doing such a thing and then saying, well, I can't buy this product because the people who made it worked with other people I don't like. I used to work for Starbucks and Target years ago, and as a Christian, both companies support a lot of left-wing causes and secular ideologies that I fundamentally disagree with. In fact, I would argue that most major corporations do. I think in some cases, you do have to be able to compartmentalize and say, well, they're hiring me to do a job which has nothing to do with any of that, or I'm not paying them to support these causes, I'm paying them for a product I think is worth my time and money. Will the company use that money to support things I don't like? Probably, but the local stores and such are primarily using that to pay employees and keep the lights on. Furthermore, the idea that I'm not going to buy this game because I want to send a message to the developers that I don't want them working with people like Hit Detection or SBI sounds really good and principled, but that only works if the people get the message. Maybe we should trash the place, send them a little message. I don't think he's going to get that message, Joe. There are tons of games I don't buy that I have no interest in that have been worked on by these sort of narrative development DEI ESG groups. 
Am I sending them a message by not buying them? Probably not. Why? Because they were never games I was going to buy in the first place, regardless of who worked on them. That doesn't send a message. And even if they were, unless I'm actively contacting the developers and saying, I just want you to know I was going to buy your game, but now I'm not because of X, Y, or Z reason, then how are they going to know why I didn't buy it? They don't know me from a hole in the ground, so what do they care? At what point is that any better than just virtue signaling to make yourself feel good? Even if I am just one person, my wallet will not be going to that, and it will make me feel better. Again, I understand the position, and I respect those who try to consistently hold to that standard. It's just not one that I hold to myself. And that's not to say you should just willingly associate or support causes you believe to be fundamentally immoral. If that's what you believe this amounts to, then by all means, don't support it. This is a conscience issue, and everyone needs to be convinced in their own mind what's true and what's not. Now, from a Christian perspective, I would say this would be in the same category as other liberties, where as long as the individual doesn't believe they are violating their conscience, then that's fine. Just don't try to force your conscience on someone else, since they may not be as mature as yourself yet, or you may not be as mature as them. Sometimes it's just not that deep. Again, you're going to have people who support things you don't like, no matter who you are, and you've got to figure out how to deal with that. The Apostle Paul actually talks about this very thing, and when writing to the church at Corinth, he said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not at all mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the greedy and swindlers, or with idolaters, for then you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a sexually immoral person, or a greedy person, or an idolater, or is verbally abusive, or habitually drunk, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a person. For what business of mine is it to judge outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? That's 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 12. Now, Paul is pointing out that those who are not believers, those who remain unregenerate sinners, are going to do unregenerate sinner things. Just like if you buy a fox and put it in a house, it's going to do fox things. Know what I mean? Why would you expect anything different? And when it comes to those within the church, we absolutely hold them to a higher standard and root that sort of thing out. Now, that doesn't mean Paul didn't preach the gospel and call people to repent of idolatry or other sins. He absolutely did. But those who claim Christ should be held to a higher standard. I would say the same thing in this situation. Progressives and leftists are going to do progressive and leftist things. Even if you choose to boycott them into submission, they still believe those same things that you believe are infesting and destroying the industry. All you've really accomplished is getting them to figure out less obvious and more subversive ways of shoving their messages into things. The message. You've done nothing to convince them their position is wrong other than trying to punish them Financially, these people are not doing these things primarily because of the money they get. They're doing it because they believe it's the right thing to do, generally speaking. I'm not saying there aren't grifters out there, but I don't feel like that's the majority of them. I realize I've gone off on a bit of a tangent here. That's true. But I think it's important to allow for disagreement over these issues without demonizing each other. You convince nobody by screeching at them and blaming them for destroying an entire industry when, realistically... The reasons for the current decline we see among Western developers and the industry at large is due to a host of issues, not just one singular issue surrounding DEI and ESG. Put another way, when have you gotten into an argument with a spouse or a significant other, insulted them to their face and called them an idiot for disagreeing, and then they said, oh my goodness, you're so right. How did I not see this before? Thank you for pointing out the error of my ways. Yeah, I didn't think so. Lastly, is the game worth full price? Well, economically, you're the only one who can answer that. Given the amount of labor and work that went into the game, and hiring voice actors, mocap, sound designers, and a whole crew to rebuild the game from scratch, well, that costs money, and the developers have to recoup the cost of their labor. Given the quality I see here, complaints people have about Unreal Engine notwithstanding, I don't think them charging full price is unreasonable. Now, that said, I typically try to gauge whether a game is worth it or not by using the dollar per hour rule. 
If I can get as much playtime out of a game as I paid for it, not counting taxes, at a rate of a dollar per hour, then I tend to think it's worth the cost. This is much easier with things like RPGs, which can, in some cases, last between 60 to 100 hours or more. With this game, even with it being twice as long as the original and rushing through it again to get the last of the New Game Plus endings, I only got about 24 hours or so of time out of it. Again, the original game wasn't terribly long either, and it launched at full price back in the day as well, and I don't remember people complaining then, even though, calculating for inflation, this game isn't really overpriced in comparison. Maybe it's because I'm not used to finishing a game so quickly that I question whether full price was worth it for me. Let me put it this way. If I hadn't been planning on reviewing the game for this and getting it done close to release, I would probably have waited for it to go on sale, but that's only because of the rule I usually set for this sort of thing. Then again, I don't recall how much time I got from playing the Resident Evil 2 remake or even the RE4 remake. I tend to play RPGs more, so I typically don't have to worry about it. And put it another way, if you're still on the fence, then by all means wait for a sale or something. That's perfectly reasonable. I'm not going to tell someone not to pay full price for it either, since, as I said, I don't think it's an unreasonable price, considering what went into making the game and how expensive that can get. I absolutely believe people should get paid for the quality of work they do, but, as a good capitalist, I also think you're the one who determines whether a product is worth your money. Like I said, I'm torn on whether or not I personally feel I should have paid full price outside of the purposes of reviewing it. I loved my time with the game. I had a blast, and it gave me an experience I hadn't had in a long time that I had missed having. A genuine, thrilling, stress-inducing psychological horror game. At the same time, given what I said about some of the pacing issues, I wouldn't have wanted it to be any longer. About the only thing I would have wanted is for them to maybe include the Born from a Wish story. I think that would have probably made up the difference. So, I guess my conclusion would be... If you want to support the developers and encourage them in what they're doing and send a message to Konami that we want more like this and hopefully get a solid remake of the first game, something that desperately needs to be done, and if you want to send that message loud and clear, then sure, pay full price for it. If money's tight but you still want to support them, then sure, wait for a sale. If you want to do that but you want to know what the original was like first, and eh, go check out the enhanced PC version because it's an incredible remaster, even if it isn't an official remaster. The remake in no way replaces the original any more than the Resident Evil remakes replace the originals. They all have their place, and I think they're definitely worth experiencing in their original forms at least once. Anyway, this is a lot longer than I had intended it to be, but I'm sure you can see now why a more direct comparison between the original and the remake regarding zones and the story itself need to be separate. There's a lot more to say, but hopefully you get the gist of it. Excellent atmosphere, solid challenge even on standard difficulty, great sound design, and the story is handled with tremendous care, and in certain cases, I think, enhanced. If you stuck around this long, Thanks for watching. I'll be back later with the rest of my thoughts on the game in more depth and with spoilers, so if you're wanting a more in-depth analysis, keep an eye out for that. Oh, and speaking of horror, if you haven't been keeping up with the recent adaptation of Junji Ito's Uzumaki on Adult Swim, available on Max the next day, you're missing out. Probably the best adaptation I've ever seen of his work by far, and Uzumaki is an incredible piece of horror, so check that out when you can too. Anyways, till next time, you guys take care.